Hi, my name is Lisa Galea, and I'm a professor of psychology at the University of British Columbia, and I serve as a sex and gender champion for the BC Support Unit. Welcome to the Tapestry Module on Sex and Gender Considerations, brought to you by the BC Support Unit. So first I'm going to define what I think of as sex and gender. Sex being the biological and physiological characteristics that define males, females, and intersex individuals. Gender, most people think of as gender identity, but it's actually more complicated than that. It's a psychosocial construct, which is how a given society uh, has expectations of your roles within that society based on your gender identity. And that's society from many different levels, your home life, your education, work life, and uh, in the greater community. For both sex and gender, it's neither one of these terms is binary, and especially for gender, it's constantly evolving. So it's really important to listen to those diverse communities that are out there. Any of the disparities that we talk about in the literature, we're often talking about differences between males and females or men versus women, but it's really important to understand that for indigenous communities, people of color, trans and gender diverse individuals, these disparities are many fold greater than any that you see between males and females or men and women. So why is it important to consider sex and gender in your research? It's important because we know that there are a number of disparities. So unfortunately, most of the disparities that we do know of in the literature stem from setting that binary, males and females, men and women. So for example, you might very well know that women are more likely to live longer than men do, but women are also more likely to live with chronic illnesses than men are. And a study came out a few years ago showing that women on average were diagnosed two years later than men are uh, for the very same disease. And this is true even for diseases where you might see more women than men having that disease or being diagnosed with that disease. Now, there are probably many reasons for this, uh, both on the sex and gender consideration side. So, for example, most of the literature that's out there has been based on the male physiology, not just the male physiology, but uh, people who identify as men and cisgendered and white men. And that has caused uh, us to have symptoms or uh, descriptions of diseases that are based on that default. So even in diseases where you might see more women are diagnosed, so for example in depression, you also see that they're more likely to uh, have what are called, quote, atypical symptoms which is kind of confusing. If you think that there's a two to one discrepancy in who's diagnosed with depression, and yet that population is described as having more atypical symptoms, that's purely based on our lack of knowledge of who uh, is coming down with that disease. And it's not just the prevalence of disease, it's also that, as I am suggesting, the manifestation of that disease that might be very important, very different between gender diverse individuals um, as well as uh, men and women. And also that suggests that the treatment might be completely different between uh, those different groups. And that's very rarely studied. And that's why I think it's so important to study this. So I've given you an example from the depression literature, but let's think about cardiovascular disease. Men, on the other hand, are more likely to be diagnosed with cardiovascular disease. However, when you look at incidence rates of cardiovascular disease, you actually see a shift in the ratio. So right around middle age, you actually see that women are, are more likely to be diagnosed with cardiovascular disease. Again, you see differences in the manifestation of symptoms. So women don't show those sort of typical uh, symptoms that you see with heart attacks, like numbness in the arm, pain in the chest. They do show some of those symptoms, but they also feel general malaise, uh, sometimes jaw pain, for example. So again, because so much of the literature has been based on the males and men and male physiology, we don't know enough about different kinds of presentations of symptoms in women, and certainly very little about gender diverse individuals. Now, why is this, again, so important? It's not just for the diagnosis of disease, but also for treatment. 
An example of this is from Lazaroids. Lazaroids were a treatment that literally were named after um, Lazarus because it literally rose people from the dead who had had a stroke. So in a clinical trial that they ran, uh, they didn't actually find a significant difference between the treated and untreated groups. And the reason for that, when they did subsequent analysis, was that Lazaroids worked in men, worked really well in men, but did not work at all in women. So we lose out when we don't consider sex and gender in our research, because here we've lost this drug that we know works very well in one segment of the population, in men, but not well in other individuals. I hope I've given you a little bit of a tidbit about how much we lose out when we don't consider sex and gender in our research. It's also not just benefiting one sex or one gender. It benefits us all when we consider sex and gender in our research. I also want to acknowledge that this is a complex and fast evolving field, but it's also really amazing and exciting that the BC Support Unit is providing a space for us through the Trappistry platform to share our knowledges and reflections on sex and gender research. And I invite you to do so because only by being inclusive can we improve the health for all of us.